Mr. Jones Sawyer, Subcommittee 5 on Public Safety. Um, and I also want to thank our committee members, um, uh, Freddie Rodriguez, um, Mark Stone, Diane Harkey, and uh, Melissa Melendez. Um, we, we had a very good um, committee. Um, I think even at times people couldn't tell the Democrats from the Republicans um, on a lot of our discussions. Um, also want to <laughs> also want to make sure that um, our consultant staff, uh, Marvin Dion, and uh, from my staff, Stephanie Burry, worked tirelessly to make sure that we had the material we need so we could make the appropriate decisions. Uh, I also want to thank Secretary Beard and the Corrections, um, the Judicial Council and the Chief Justice, um, the AG's Office, Attorney General, um, Emergency Services, Cal Military, also the people of labor. Um, the court receiver was extremely helpful, um, and the residents of California, mostly those that were affected by both the courts and people who have been incarcerated in prisons. Also the advocates uh, on, on those people's behalf, and especially the public safety professionals, CCPOA, the sheriffs, and the local police, whose input was invaluable in, in helping us um, formulate this budget. Uh, we approved a budget um, that was a little bit higher than what we approved last year of $63 million. We went to $301 million this year, uh, more than last year. Um, this includes $160 million um, by, proposed by the governor, an additional $110 million for trial court operations, $20 million for collaborative courts. Um, most of that money will come from the recidivism um, reduction fund because we really were concerned about making sure we had drug courts, juvenile courts, mental health courts, and veterans courts, of course, that really have an impact in local communities. Another 11 million for dependency counsel, legal representation for people who don't have um, representation in the foster care system, especially children. Um, we also um, put forward funding that supports the recommendations of the Select Committee on Justice Reinvestment. That's the, that's the committee that both uh, Tom Amiano and myself chaired. And I also want to thank those members that went to a tremendous amount of meetings all over the state to discuss how we can improve um, our prison system. Um, we adopted a $100 million plan intended to reduce the recidivism based on the Assembly Select Committee on Justice Reinvestment recommendations. The, the Select Committee convened seven informational hearings in San Francisco, um, Sacramento, and Los Angeles with the purpose of gaining a better understanding of the challenges negatively impacting California's criminal justice system at the local and state level. The plan consists of the, of the following, the collaborative course, $20 million that I mentioned before, $10 million for community-based organizations and nonprofit organizations operating recidivism programs in local communities. They, they're the ones that are most impacted and also have been have the most success. Also an additional $10 million for community-based organizations and nonprofit organizations operating recidivism programs in prisons and jails. $25 million for in-community reentry facilities focused on mental health populations. $11 million to expand substance abuse treatment to 10 more CDCR uh, facilities. Another 800000 planning grant for the, for the California Leadership Academy for Youthful Felons. Now $9 million for GOBES in support of social innovation bond programs. $9 million for costs associated re with repealing California's lifetime ban on CalWORKs and CalFresh participation for drug felons who were not allowed because of legislation um, to participate in these programs programs that would help them be able to not go back to uh, prison. 300000 to establish a clearinghouse database of employers willing to hire felons. Uh, another um, opportunity in which we felt that once people have a job, the, the chances of them going back to prison go way, way down. Um, Two million to ensure inmates have um, state identification cards upon release. Um, that came from Assemblyman um, Mark Stone and from his testimony that a lot of people are, are released and they can't even get identification cards or even a driver's license, and that is key to be able to find employment and keep employment. One million to restore past reduction to college programs provided in CDCR facilities, and finally, two million for grants to cities with the highest rate of serious crimes. And that's it for me. Um, before I call on my uh, Committee members, for their comments or questions, I want to allow our Vice Chair, um, Assembly Member Gorell, but I will start taking a list for those of you who want to. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. Uh, I wanted to thank the members of the Budget Committee for all their hard work, particularly the subcommittees, the staff, and the members. It's really where all the hard work uh, takes place, and um, and the response is, um, has been has been very inspirational. I mean, it's just a lot of work. 
Um, and, and it's nice to sit on a budget committee when we have uh, additional revenues coming in about projections. It's an opportunity for all of us to agree in, in, in many uh, general areas to reinvest in education, um, as we're doing, reinvest in courts, reinvest in um, infrastructure and in beds and programs at uh, the local level for our, our public safety. Uh, and th those, are all, those are all very positive um, areas that, uh, that we'll, we'll, we'll continue to work on together. Um, but we also have to have a measured response, and, and that's part of this too, um, that we need to be uh, reflective of because this assembly budget does um, adopt overly optimistic revenue projections, far above those of the Department of Finance and, and those uh, that the LAO has uh, put out, but, but we know that Standard & Poor's has already, um, Standard & Poor's has already uh, stated that, for example, should the state adopt these LAOs or other higher revenue forecasts uh, for the purposes of increasing ongoing spending, that it could endanger our current positive rating outlook. What we, need to, what we need to do here, generally speaking, is to avoid the mistakes of the past. Um, the obligations that are created in the Assembly's version of the budget with new and expanded programmatic spending, um, those are, that's programmatic spe spending that is guaranteed to grow, uh, whereas these uh, Prop 30 temporary tax increases uh, will not be there uh, into perpetuity, nor will the guaranteed growth slow growth in our economy that has brought in these, these additional uh, revenues. So we need to be reflective of that. We need to be measured. And that's why um, when we look at the Assembly's budget as, as it relates uh, to the Governor's budget, um, his, his framework has been called frugal. But, but I do want to point out that's a $12 billion jump over last year's spending plan his current um, proposal, and it, and it will be, if adopted, the governor's version, will be the largest spending plan that the state of California has ever put forth. And uh, that's more money than ever. And, that, and, that, and that, is, that cannot be taken lightly. And that is even with the governor's significantly more conservative revenue estimates. Um, other areas just to be concerned about uh, that I just want to raise are that the assembly um, does not set aside a reserve at least not the same level of reserve that the governor's um, budget does. There's the rainy day fund that's set aside, but there's no reserve. So in a, in a, se in a sense, uh, the assembly budget's rainy day fund is its reserves operationally. And the last but not least is the ongoing concern with directing um, the money in the assembly budget or the governor's budget toward high-speed rail. And um, how do we reconcile where these um, monies were originally supposed to intended to go to and where they're going to now, I, I think, is, um, is something that, that, that we're going to have a continued debate about and will hopefully get reconciled. But um, it was not certainly where these monies were originally intended to go to. Um, so those are just general comments, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you for that opportunity. And we look forward to uh, continuing to work out these details in conference. Thank you. Apologies. Thank you, uh, Assemblymember Gurel, Vice Chair. And I've got now the beginning of a list. And if there's other members who want to uh, ask a question or make a comment, please let me know. And we'll turn to uh, Assemblymember Daly. Madam Chair, in my haste, I overlooked uh, thanking two very important people to my committee's work, Genevieve and Chris. I just want to thank you very much. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Um, Daly. Now, Assembly Member Chesbrough. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the budget is an architecture, and uh, you know you move a piece or pull a piece out, and it changes the rest of it. Not possible to um, to to make um, one piece move without affecting many other pieces. So, for that reason, I, in spite of some of the comments I'll be making here about some things that I think need to be worked on going into conference committee and, and the one leadership's meeting with the governor, I will be supporting the overall motion to move the budget today. Uh, so these are not meant to be that sort of uh, questioning. Uh, I also want to say that we had a phenomenal year at Sub 1, and I really want to praise uh, Chair Weber for her work and leadership. Uh, it's a very difficult committee chair, I know from experience, and uh, she did a magnificent job. And, and uh, not only do I appreciate the outcome, I appreciate the process as well. So, um, 
And uh, I'm very happy with many of the restorations, but in particular, I think an area that has been uh, hit twice in two recessions and two budget cycles, I've had the privilege or the pain of going through, uh, and that was the developmental disabilities budget. And I think the effort to bring that back on a bipartisan basis has a lot of support. And these are folks who have suffered uh, a lot from the state's inability to, to fulfill the, the promise of the Lanterman Act which was a very much, Mr. Lanterman was a Republican, was very much of a bipartisan uh, commitment from the very beginning, and uh, I think we're moving back that direction, and I'm, I'm thrilled about it. Um, I want to echo the chair's, uh, Chair uh, Skinner's comments about the Medi-Cal rates and dates. Uh, I understand that, you know, that we adopted a range of dates sometime between January and April when we would try to restore the Medi-Cal rates. Um, it, I guess my point of view would be if we can't, move them all to January, that we'd be real sensitive to the fact that it, particularly in underserved parts of the state, rural and urban inner city areas where there are very inadequate number of Medi-Cal providers that we perhaps try to uh, figure out, difficult task, but how we, we try to figure out who the most, what categories are the most endangered and maybe start some of them in January and others in April to not have the full cost of, of speeding it up. But I am concerned that as we're moving all these new Medi-Cal recipients, uh, in uh, into eligibility uh, that we are going to have, and we do have, but we're going to continue to have a declining number of, of uh, providers who will accept Medi-Cal. So um, with regards to sub three, I want to uh, compliment the chair and um, the staff and the members, I think overall did a great job and I'm very happy with many of the proposals that you put forward. Uh, I do want to comment on the cap and trade. I appreciate that there are some shortcomings in the governor's budget proposals for cap and trade revenue. Uh, and I strongly support the effort to apply consistent metrics and targets in order to assure that we actually achieve the greatest climate benefits from those expenditures. Um, however, I'm concerned that the assembly plan may go too far throwing out some very good proposals such as Cal Recycle's organic waste diversion proposal in favor of an unpredictable competitive allocation process run by governor's appointees on the Strategic Growth Council. Um, I feel that we're not, we don't really know what we're buying here. So it's kind of an open-ended question. Uh, I, for one, would rather appropriate funds for well-crafted proposals than kick the decisions back to the administration. And furthermore, if the idea is to make the allocation of funds competitive, I have to wonder why we have left $200 million in funds for, uh, out of that competition and earmarked that money to ARB to spend on clean vehicle rebates. So, um, so I, 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 there seems like there's some inconsistency there. Um, but in any case, again, I will be supporting all of the hard work that's gone into uh, constructing this budget and uh, appreciate everybody's effort involved. And I'm very happy to be leaving this uh, house uh, on a much more positive note than um, when I arrived. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Assemblymember Chesbro. And uh, given your long experience as a former budget chair, we appreciate your comments and your work and your continued work on this committee. Um, Assemblymember Nastande. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank uh, Chairman of the Committee. I sat on uh, Mr. Marsucci for the good work that, that he did in the committee, in particular with the work on the CTE, uh, the ROCP, ROCPs, uh, keeping that in the budget. I think career technical education is, I think it's very important that it, it be kept as a categorical, as the Chairman has fought for. It's, um, I think the categoricals, what the, what the governor has done made sense, collapsing most of those. But I think it's in a case where the pendulum has swung too far to where we wiped out every single one. Um, and I, I think career technical education needs to be kept as a categorical. I, I know the API score going forward will have a element of CT in that in, a, in an attempt to uh, make that part of measuring performance. But I'm afraid with the, the new cost for CalSTRS being pushed down, that uh, CTE will be the first on the chopping block. And um, so I just want to once again thank the chairman for his work in that area. Greatly appreciate and hope you're successful in conference. Thank you. Um, now, Assemblymember Campos. Well, I um, have to say that uh, Assemblymember Nastandi and I will agree on that uh, particular item. Uh, I am as well pleased to see that we've restored the uh, $380 million to, um, to dedicated funding for apprenticeship and career uh, tech. 
uh, technical education. And I know that uh, I had uh, put a bill forward, and you did as well, because this was a priority for us. So pleased to see that all the work that your committee has done um, and the governor <coughs> has also seen this as value is um, in the budget. Um, the other thing that I wanted to also recognize is the, the work that uh, I was able to, to work with um, Chairman um, Bloom with in the high-speed rail and the work that we did there. So it was, I think, a rewarding experience to have gone through that process, even though there were challenging times in, in the dialogue. but. Uh, a good experience uh, to, to be able to work with a good group of people on that particular issue. The other area that I just want to mention is the IHSS home care. Uh, I'm glad to see that there's funding for that. I think that uh, when we don't recognize and don't value individuals that take care of our family members and our greater community by respecting them with the tools that they need. And I actually had the opportunity to meet with some workers this past weekend and shared with them some of uh, the, the funding that would be available and secure their issues. Uh, they were a little relieved, so I'm hoping that this continues to move forward for uh, California's sake. Um, thank you, Ms. Chair, Ms. Skinner, for the work that you've done. I know it's not an easy job uh, making sure that you bring a, a, a budget that uh, will be good for California. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Ms. Campos. Um, not seeing other Mr. Mullen. Sorry, Mr. Mullen, Assemblymember Mullen. I know it's late, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. I just want to thank you for your work. Thank the subcommittee chairs. Uh, a, a very brief comment about early childhood ed. Uh, I'm very encouraged about the 10 percent increase. The 47,000 slots. Um, my one note of caution is um, there's no funding for additional uh, facilities to house these additional slots. The uh, Child Care Facilities Revolving Fund uh, could have been a resource to address uh, the facilities issue, uh, but those funds are nearly depleted. The uh, Child Care Facilities Renovation and Repair Grant Program, which until now uh, has been underfunded through reappropriations from the revolving fund, uh, will soon be depleted. So it's just a note of caution and something to be mindful of uh, as we move forward to accommodate uh, those slots. But overall, uh, uh, very pleased with the progress we're making on that front. Thank you. Yes, it did go to them. Thank you, Ms. Assembly Member Mullen. Uh, Assembly Member Chavez. I'll be brief also, but I just wanted to make a comment. First of all, I enjoy being part of the budget issue, but budgets, as you know, are made of assumptions and deal with the revenues and expenditures. And this budget we have here uh, presented to us assumes a higher level of revenue. Uh, in the assumptions that you have, you'll note that the unemployment rate that was demonstrated by the uh, federal government is uh, considerably different than what's proposed proposed by California, which I think many of us who are sitting here for 12 years are going to see the impact of that in our assumptions. We're also in the, in the report, you'll notice in the assumption of the budget, when it deals with drought and the impact upon agriculture, it actually pretty much dismisses it. It doesn't have an impact of revenue from the drought and agriculture, though we know in the uh, just all the news from Memorial Day, the impact it's having at the grocery store. And the other item it mentions in the assumptions is the impact of the Affordable Care Act. It discusses it, but doesn't really give us any hard numbers. So I think those assumptions are going to come to rest. That being said, in the Higher Education Committee, I'd like to say it was a great opportunity to be there. I hope as we reality comes forward that we will maintain our commitment in these important areas. One is the $1.25 billion investment in Common Core. We need to make sure Common Core is successful for our children, and I think we need to continue to push that. The $250 million for the state preschool program, as we said in the committees, that really doesn't meet the needs if we don't invest in the early uh, cognitive development of early uh, children at the zero to five age. We'll not see the results we want to see in K through 12, so I hope we'll continue to do that. The two point five in growth in uh, the community colleges. There was a lot of discussion about access. I'm glad that we did that. 
and then our commitment to the university and state colleges, a plus up that we did, I'm glad we did that. Uh, so on one hand, I'm saying I'm happy with what the education did. I think our priority is exactly right. Uh, but I'm also concerned from a long-term perspective as far as our, our revenue projections. Whoops, wrong. Thank you, Assemblymember Chavez. I think we got everyone. Um, so appreciate your comments. Uh, we Part of our framework in thinking about this, the subchairs and I was as I opened, ensuring stability, but also expanding opportunity. And we know fiscal stability is clearly in building a reserve and a rainy day fund and in paying off debt, but there's also a fiscal stability to smart investments, investments that uh, help reduce state costs later. If we, uh, if our one in four current poor children uh, stay poor throughout their lives, their costs to the state will be a large burden. If we can help reverse that, then clearly we, we are making a smart investment that reduces future state costs. Um, our infrastructure investments will help put some people that we know have not yet gone back to work, back to work, but also if you can deal with some deferred maintenance, that saves you money. Then if you wait till it's, uh, I always say, if you got it, a roof that you know isn't leaking yet, but you know if you repair now before it starts leaking, it's uh, cheaper than when you've created the damage for the leaky roof. So some of the investments that uh, are contained in here are smart and have economic return. Um, we could discuss more, but we'll have lots of opportunity as we go uh, back into conference committee. So let's have a motion. I'll move the assembly budget. Second. Second. Okay, um, pl uh, please call the roll. Skinner? Aye. Skinner, aye. Gorell? No. Gorell, no. Allen? No. Allen, no. Bloom? Aye. Bloom, aye. Campos? Aye. Campos, aye. Chavez? No. Chavez, no. Chesbro? Aye. Chesbro, aye. Dubovny? Aye. Dubovny, aye. Daly? Aye. Daly, aye. Dickinson? Aye. Dickinson, aye. Gordon? Gordon I. Grove, Harkey, Joan Sawyer. Aye. Joan Sawyer I. Logue. Logue no. Mansour. No. Mansour no. Melendez. No. Melendez no. Mullen. Aye. Mullen I. Murasucci. Aye. Murasucci I. Nazarian. Nastande. Nastande no. Patterson. Rodriguez. Aye. Rodriguez I. Stone. Aye. Stone I. Ting. Ting I Wagner, no. Wagner no Weber, uh, Weber I. Motion passes. Where is he? Um, we'll hold the roll in, open just a minute for our missing member. Get him now. Yes, and uh, other members can. We are won't adjourn until we have our missing member. But you are all of those of you who have cast your vote are free to go. Thank you.